Okay, well, it's um, it's uh, 35 minutes past now. So um, it is um, my great pleasure to, to welcome uh, Mukund Tatai here to uh, the Theory of Living Systems webinar. Um, Mukund uh, did his undergraduate degree at Cornell before a PhD at MIT, and then uh, went straight to become a junior faculty at the National Center of Biological Sciences. Um, where he is still there. He's part of the Simon Center for the Study of Living Machines, where I had the great pleasure of doing a postdoc. Um, and um, with that, Mukund, um, I, I'll let you, you take it away if you're happy. Great. Thank you, uh, Richard, and thanks for the invitation. It's uh, um, really, I think, an interesting time in science where these kinds of seminars have become more common um, as one of the side effects of the lockdowns, but it, it does mean that we get to uh, talk and interact with people we wouldn't have, uh, you know, maybe done so otherwise in, in the in the uh, in the real physical world. Um, and um, uh, thanks, Manu, for for uh, helping set up all the the administrative stuff here. So um, I'm going to be talking about uh, our work on vesicle traffic networks, and um, I know many physicists may not uh, know what those things are, so I'll, I'll give a biological introduction before. Uh, jumping into all the all the details. Um, I just want to start by saying that um, uh, this work is done with uh, uh, Somia Mani, uh, a former PhD student who is now in um, uh, at the IBS in Korea, and uh, Keshav Krishnan, who is a, a computer science student who's now um, at uh, doing his PhD at the Department of Mathematics at UIUC. Um, so, uh, of course, this is XKCD, um, always gets to the heart of things. Uh, this uh, panel, this uh, cartoon is about uh, something called uh, uh, the boat puzzle or, or river crossing puzzles. And, uh, you know, we've, we've done all these things in, in school. They used to be very popular, right? So somebody comes and says, I need to cross the river. I have a wolf, a goat, a cabbage. Obviously, the wolf eats the goat and the goat eats the cabbage. And so you can't put them all together on the same boat. Um, and then there's, there's an easy solution to this. Um, but then biology is much more complicated than this one-step process, right? So uh, someone else shows up and says, uh, I have two wolves, 100 cabbages, and I have a wolf that can operate a boat, and so on and so forth. And um, really, this flavor of increasing uh, constraints of what you can put on a boat is at the heart of the, the little problem that I'm going to outline for you today, and you'll get a flavor of that. Um, but before I start on that, um, I just want to mention what we work on in my group uh, more broadly. So, so we think about eukaryotic cells um, across the entire spectrum of eukaryotic complexity from single celled organisms, amoeba, paramecium, yeast, uh, to multicellular. Um, and there's sort of three levels of this. Um, the, the question of eukaryotic origins has to do with you know, how prokaryotic ancestors uh, transition to the, the eukaryotic cellular form. It's still a very, very open question, but a lot of exciting work is happening recently with more data. Um, and so part of that is just natural history, uh, which means, you know, exactly what events happened at what time and how to reconstruct that process using, say, molecular phylogenetics or indeed real fossils that are buried in the ground. And there are people who do that kind of thing. Um, it's also the question of how a eukaryotic cell functions. Uh, if you start from a prokaryotic form, which didn't have all this internal um, spatial organization, no cytoskeleton and, and no organelles and membrane traffic. And all that is a, is a, is a physics question, right? So how do you take molecular interactions and make this uh, beautiful spatial structure of a eukaryotic cell? And uh, finally, uh, there's the interesting why question, um, which again, there's a lot of very nice recent work of evolution in the lab of, you know, why a eukaryotic cell in certain contexts uh, has better success than a prokaryotic one. And a lot of that has to do with the spatial structure, the ability to internalize food and digest it and uh, sh change shape, communicate more effectively and, uh, and so on. Um, so the, the broad canvas is uh, it's actually it's huge, right? So um, eukaryotic cells arose um, a couple of billion years ago, um, following the great oxygenation event when photosynthesis created oxygen in the rocks and then in the air. Um, around that time, two billion years ago, you had the mitochondrial endosymbiosis, where um, it looks like two kinds of prokaryotic cells. One of them is an archaeon, and another one is a bacterium, somehow uh, entered into a symbiosis, which eventually became the so-called endosymbiosis. The bacterium became the mitochondrion, and um, 
change the energy balance of the eukaryotic cell, uh, which led to the ability of eukaryotes to have larger genomes, more proteins for every function. Um, and one of the byproducts of this was the thing I'm interested in, which is internal membranes. Now, we don't know the order in which all this happened. The, the, when the nucleus arose compared to the mitochondria and when phagocytosis and plasma membrane invagination, all that cool stuff, right? But we can trace some of this using molecules that participate in those processes. And a lot of the papers I've out outlined on this page um, outline some of our work in that area. Um, but, uh, you know, assume you have a eukaryotic cell, um, you have all these compartments and you have stuff moving around between them, then it becomes a biophysical question of how a eukaryote maintains its compartmentalized structure, the, the Golgi, the ER, the vacuoles, the lysosome, everything else. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So the vesicle traffic network is this uh, intricate network of different membrane bounded organelles and small transport vesicles that move stuff between them. And the cool thing about it from a physicist's point of view is that this global structure is really determined by local molecular rules. Uh, so it's stuff that's happening at rapid time scales and at nanometer spatial scales, which build up to form fluxes and changes in composition and eventually lead to the um, structure of the cell. And obviously, that's a very big uh, way of formulating the question. And I'm going to show you that we have had some insight into how these local rules determine the global uh, structure. So what is the vesicle traffic network? So these are some really um, uh, beautiful electron micrographs. Um, by Palade, where you see, um, you know, for example, this the Golgi stack, which is this sort of pancake structure in cross section. You see the big things labeled V, which are vacuoles, and the small little thing C that's actually a, a transport vesicle. You see it in uh, um, uh, the other perpendicular section. You see these little vesicles budding and fusing out from the Golgi, indicated by these arrows. So, what are those vesicles? So this um, is a very nice paper. This is a, it's basically a, you know, in some sense, an artist's impression, but uh, scientifically uh, motivated. Um, this is what a transport vesicle looks like. That sort of greenish substrate there that looks like a ball, that's uh, a membrane lipid bilayer. The vesicle has stuff on the inside. Um, and then on its surface, it's, it's absolutely studded with all kinds of different molecules. Some of them are membrane integral, meaning they they're really stuck into the membrane. Uh, and these include just the lipids, transmembrane proteins, and other tightly membrane associated objects. And some of them are membrane peripheral. They can come from the cytoplasm, they can bind and unbind. Those include, for example, the RAB and other kinds of GTPs. Um, so, so why is the vesicle so, so decorated? And the reason is because the vesicle needs to know where to go. If it's made in one part of the cell, it needs to go to some other part of the cell. And that addressing system, all that information is contained on its surface. Okay, so this, this is sort of the address that tells the vesicle where it needs to go. And um, very quickly, uh, the way that, uh, that process happens has been investigated in you know, deep molecular detail um, by um, cell biologists. And, um, you know, they've really uncovered the, the series of events in space and time that allow vesicles to form and tell them where to go and which molecules are involved. And uh, this figure outlines the important players, and I'll just mention them to you here. On the left part of the figure, you have the so-called donor compartment. Let's say it's the endoplasmic reticulum. On the right side, you have the target compartment. Let's say it's the, the, the cis Golgi. And you need to move stuff from the ER to the Golgi before it gets secreted. So the way that happens is that a vesicle buds from the ER, and the budding curvature is induced by proteins that come from the cytoplasm bind, and these are called coats and adapters. Uh, the clathrin code, for example, uh, operates at the plasma membrane, and in this case, it's the COP2 code. What the adapters do is they pull cargo into the vesicle, and it's just the right type of cargo, so it's highly selective, and then the vesicle fully buds up. And so you have this little ball, uh, and it drops all the, the factors that were needed to make the budding, and then it's just left with this uncoated vesicle. And on that vesicle, you have these important transmembrane proteins, among them this important red one, which is called the V-snare, the vesicle snare. Um, so these vesicles can then move throughout the cell. Sometimes they move on cytoskeletal tracks and eventually they reach close to the target compartment. And what happens at the target compartment is that there are also um, uh, cofactors on the target that label the target, just like there are factors in the vesicle that label the vesicle. And these two factors interact and check whether this is the right vesicle for the right target. And if so, you have fusion. 
And an important part of that process, certainly not the only one, are the snare proteins. As I said, there's a V snare on the vesicle. There's also a so-called T snare on the target. And snares come in many, many, many different flavors in the cell. And a vesicle must have a V snare. The target must have a T snare. And these two must have a strong physical interaction in order for the vesicle to fuse. And it's specific. So a vesicle destined for the cis Golgi will not be able to fuse to the plasma membrane, for example. Okay, and that snare binding uh, actually uh, contains some of the energy needed to, to, to overcome the energy barrier of uh, vesicle fusion at physiological timescales. There are many other factors here. There are things that come from the cytoplasm that label vesicles and targets and so on, and I, I won't really discuss them here, um, although they are important for conferring specificity to this process, saying which vesicles go to which places. So um, a long time ago, when we first started this uh, work, we were interested in whether this minimal dynamics is sufficient to explain how you get different compositions of compartments in a cell. Um, and, and exactly where in this process are those, uh, are those compositions encoded? And so what, what you have in a cell is you know, many different locations. In this little cartoon, I've shown you the ER, the Golgi, um, the early endosomes, EE, the plasma membrane, and so on. And you have these vesicles that couple or, or drive fluxes between different compartments. And as I said, um, what is on a vesicle is determined by molecules at the source compartment and where a vesicle will fuse is determined by binding between stuff on the vesicle like the V-snare and stuff on the target like the T-snare. So you can actually encode all this in, in a simple um, uh, mathematical model, a little dynamical system uh, with some sort of minimal specificity of molecules, the resulting fluxes and so on, and see what happens. And indeed what does happen is um, with the right kind of parameters and just the right kind of non-linearity for specificity, right? It doesn't bind or very low binding below some uh, concentration, very high binding above, those kinds of ingredients. Um, you do get a cell with compositionally distinct compartments coupled by vesicle flows. And it is, a, is, it is really a steady state of that, uh, of that system. Um, so this is a busy slide and I won't go into it uh, in great detail, but uh, just uh, look at the bottom here. What we plotted on the bottom is in some sense, um, uh, principal components, also a projection of the chemical compositions of many different membrane bounded compartments in a cell under the kinds of dynamics I just mentioned in the previous slide. And what happens is that the uh, different compartments, which you know they're they called organelles, right? Uh, they will evolve over time because they exchange molecules and they change composition, but eventually, under the right conditions, they hit steady compositions. And I've shown examples here where um, many different organelles in a cell will converge to just three compositions or just four compositions and so on. So, so the number of organelles in a cell, the number of distinct types of um, compositionally distinct membrane spaces is also determined by these basic molecular interactions. And I, I thought that was a really cool result. The reason being that uh, the phylogenetics indicates that over the course of eukaryotic evolution, the molecules that label these compartments have duplicated and diverged over time. And what then we can show <clears throat> is that this can correspond to the emergence of a new type of organelle uh, in compositional space. Only in theory, this hasn't been really tested in a real system because as you can imagine, it's difficult. Okay, so that's the, that's the big picture sort of introduction to vesicle traffic for physicists. And what I'm going to be focusing on um, today is a, um, a highly constrained subsystem of the vesicle traffic network, which turns out to provide a lot of insight into uh, how the system is structured. Okay, and these are the snare proteins. And uh, I'm going to introduce you to a little bit um, of the, uh, the sort of uh, biophysics and phenomenology of snares. So what is a snare? A snare is a transmembrane protein. It turns out it's a, a, a full snare complex is a four helix bundle. There are three helices on one membrane, one on another, and they zipper up. And that zippering up uh, is what uh, allows the um, two objects, one vesicle and one target, or even two vesicles to fuse to each other. Um, so a few years ago, a really uh, surprising result um, uh, emerged uh, uh, based on using snares on reconstituted vesicles just in a tube, okay, which, is, which is the following. This blue object <coughs> is, excuse me, it's a snare. This orange object is a complementary snare. They bind. And you prepare vesicles with the 
one type of snare and another type of snare and you mix them. And of course, you can label these vesicles very nicely and you can measure the mixing rates. You can measure mixing rates of the, the, the internal um, liquid, uh, the fluid uh, uh, contained within the lipid bilayer, or you can measure the mixing of that bilayer itself. Um, and you can do this under various conditions. Now, the point about this um, paper is that they, they diluted the snare amount to such low levels compared to membrane that every little vesicle had zero or just one copy of that uh, snare. And it turns out what happens is literally the threshold for effective binding on physiological timescales is minutes is one copy of a snare on a vesicle and one on, on each on each vesicle or one copy on a vesicle and one on a target. So these objects are highly, highly fusogenic. If they're floating around and they are complementary, you will have fusion of those two objects. There's the, and it happens on minutes timescales. And therefore you have mixing of the stuff on the membrane stuff in the, um, in the fluid uh, internal space. So what this means is that if you have snares in various parts of the cell, um, you can't just let them be active all the time. Because if, if they are, this is what happens. Things just start fusing. Um, and as I sort of indicated in the cartoons earlier, you know, although fusion happens at one location, the snares are present all over the place because they move from one compartment to another. And so this kind of um, fusogenic uh, aspect will cause all kinds of aberrant fusion if the snares are not regulated properly. Now, one way to regulate um, a snare, you could imagine is just, you know, label a vesicle with the correct V snare, send it on its way. It gets to the target, it fuses, and then just destroy the snares, right? So that there's no chance that that same snare is anywhere else in the cell to be used again. And this would uh, solve the problem of this high fusogenicity because the snares are only present where they need to be. But it turns out that's not what the cell does. So, um, this is an energy intensive process, okay? Snares um, contain the free energy needed to uh, mediate rapid vesicle fusion on physiological timescales. And so one of the things that happens is after a vesicle fuses, what this, this little uh, diagram shows, on the left side, you start uh, with a sort of uh, complex where the snares have already fused, caused vesicle fusion. And so you have this four helix bundle of snares, three from one membrane, one from another. Then what happens is you have a, a bunch of other complexes that are, arrive, use ATP to literally unwind the snakes, okay? And then you separate these bundles into back into their V and T constituents. And the reason you do this is because those snares then go back to their starting location to drive another round of fusion, okay? So you don't destroy the snares every time. You actually simply unwind them and send them back on their way. And the way the energetics works out is that this is where the ATP comes in to introduce free energy into that, into that cycle. So I've said two things. Um, the first thing is that uh, snares are highly fusogenic, and uh, if they're present on the right membranes, they will cause those membranes to fuse. Uh, the second thing is that snares are reused. Once a vesicle goes from source to target and deposits its target, that means it's carried the V snare from the source to the target. That VT complex can be broken up using energy, and the V snare can be sent back to the source to be used again. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a, a parsimonious system, I guess, uh, in order to not make too many molecules to drive uh, vesicle fusion. But uh, this then causes problems for the cell in terms of the global structure of the transport graph. And that's the link that I'm going to uh, make clear to you here. So um, thought experiment, okay? So this, um, this little directed graph represents a cell. Um, each each gray ball, each node of the graph is a different kind of membrane bounded compartment. Of course, I'm not showing their spatial locations or their size and shape and so on. I mean, I'm just interested in the fact that they're distinct chemically. Um, and what the edges are, are directed edges that show that some type of vesicle starts from some source compartment and moves along and eventually fuses and delivers its cargo to some target compartment. Now, how do I get a diagram like this? Typically, you, you know, you, you read any cell biology review about vesicle traffic in say, Cerevisiae or some human cell line or in plants, and, and you find diagrams like this. Um, and the way they've been determined is that, uh, you know, each edge uh, uh, has evidence backed up by cell biology, biochemistry. We know which molecules they are. There's knockouts that cause uh, buildup of cargo on one side and so on. So, the, so there's a lot of cell biology really a huge amount that goes into 
putting forward a, a graph like this. Uh, and, you know, of course, it's incomplete. Some edges might be present, which we don't know about. These edges may be um, wrong because what we infer as direct might be indirect. There's, you know, all kinds of problems. But let's, let's assume, let's, you know, set that aside and assume that my cell biology colleague in the next lab has come and said, here's what I think. Um, the vesicle traffic network uh, of, of this particular organism uh, looks like. And so we have the ER, the cis, medial, transgolgy, endosome, lysosome, that's what all these little nodes. So then we can um, check whether it's consistent with what we know about how um, the underlying molecules behave in, in particular, as I said, the snare proteins. So let's, let's work through this and see what happens. So I'm going to consider uh, just the arrow uh, right in the middle of the picture on top, connecting two particular compartments. We know that a vesicle moves from that source to that target. And so we know that there must be a snare, a V snare on the vesicle, which I'm calling V1. And correspondingly, there must be its cognate T snare, which I'm calling T1 on the target compartment. What makes it cognate? It means that the sequences are such that they have a high binding um, efficiency. And uh, as long as this is true, then the vesicle that emerges from the source, once it gets close enough to the target, will fuse to the target and deliver cargo. And the snare pair is necessary for fusion. So that's, that's great. The issue arises when that V snare is now sitting on the target and we know eventually it must be recycled to the source because we know snares are not really destroyed on the time scales of vesicles moving around, they're, they're reused. So that's, it's easy, just, uh, Look around and uh, you can find some path that will take the V-snare back to the source compartment. Remember, it can't go through the cytosol because it's a transmembrane protein. So wherever it goes, it must go on vesicles. So which vesicles does it go on? It goes on some other vesicles in, in, in the system. And, and remember, those other vesicles have their own V-snares and T-snares. This V1 is not actually catalyzing the fusion properties of those vesicles. It's just passive cargo. It's done its job, it's going back home, and it's going to do its job again, okay? Um, but this is a problem because you know that every vesicle containing V1, V1 is highly fusogenic, it's going to fuse back to the source compartment because that has T1. So this arrow emerging from the compartment will go back unless somehow that snare is um, regulated. And we can imagine any number of ways things are regulated. It's the usual stuff, right? A lot of biochemistry, binding, unbinding, combinatorial codes, everything. Uh, I'm just going to put forward a rather simple um, scenario where we imagine there's an inhibitor molecule, um, which I'm calling I, and uh, let's assume that it's a stoichiometric inhibitor. It, it you know, literally sticks to that V snare and makes sure that it's not fusogenic anymore. Um, so great, if you have such an inhibitor, then the return path of the snare um, it's just the inhibited path. It, it, it goes back and the snare doesn't do anything bad on the way because it's inactive. Yeah, so that's fine. Um, but now this is where the, the goat, cabbage and, and wolf kind of flavor comes in. Um, the inhibitor uh, is now going from the target compartment to the source compartment and then must be recycled back. Now, if the inhibitor is cytosolic, you can do it. But suppose the inhibitor is membrane bound and there's good reason to believe that uh, it will be then you're going to have to find a path from the source back to the target for the inhibitor to follow. Now, there is an obvious path. It's the original vesicle path, right? But you can't put the inhibitor on that because it inhibit the V-snare, okay? So you're going to look around this little graph and say, okay, let me find a path here. So well, I can go boom, uh, go back, no, up here, down, ah. All right. So I found a path. It's pretty long but uh, it does exist and it works. And once I add all this up, what do we have here? This is the minimal requirement for this single vesicle on top, the V snare to bind to the T snare and cause fusion of that vesicle. And, and, and you can see how that little process has ramifications throughout the system. It means that these objects, these I's and the V's have to buy, you know, load onto the right vesicles, move through the right system. There's all kinds of specificity that goes on. And you, you, you can imagine how that works. It, it's possible in principle, right? Um, but it's really, it's not localized. It's, it's distributed throughout the system. In this particular case, it was fine. We found a way. But now let's look at 
the second part of the xkcd cartoon where somebody else shows up with a hundred goats and a wolf that uh, drives the boat or whatever it was this vesicle down here also needs a v snare and a t snare and a different one than the one was used over here good same game again right? we put the vesicle with the v snare in this case v2 and a t snare everything is fine um, v2 needs to recycle back there is a recycling path everything is fine v2 needs to be inhibited and so the inhibitor goes back everything is fine but now the inhibitor is accumulating here okay and it needs to come here and it turns out the way i set things up there is no path for it to do that and now you get in trouble because the inhibitor keeps on accumulating here the cell is no longer in steady state things will go so it turns out that the, the, the what my cell biology colleague had shown me what she thought was the trafficking system of the species must be incomplete uh, there must be some other flux pathway that allows the inhibitor to go back or i'm wrong and the inhibitor is not membrane um, integral then there's, there's some other way of regulation okay so this little game that i played was just to give you a flavor of the kinds of issues that arise uh, when you try and solve the global constraints of snare fusogenicity vesicle binding and recycling at the same time it's not easy uh, but you really don't want to do this kind of thing by hand. And this is where um, the language of graph theory uh, really comes into its own. So um, I, I was not actually familiar with, uh, with all this language before I, I started. Um, and I'm indebted to a, a computer science colleague who was at the time at the Indian Institute of Science, Arnab Bhattacharya, for teaching me about all this stuff. Um, but it's, it's, you know, so once you get into it, it's actually very, very straightforward. And I highly recommend uh, this monograph freely available online uh, by Guten and Bang Jensen on directed graphs, digraphs, theory, algorithms, and applications. Um, a really beautiful, comprehensive, modern uh, introduction to uh, graph theory, especially directed graphs, which it turns out are, of course, much more useful in the real world uh, and yet much less um, studied in the mathematical literature. For some reason, the focus is on undirected graphs. Okay, so just a little bit of language. Uh, you know what a directed graph is. It's a, it's a bunch of nodes and, uh, and edges, directed edges. Um, there is a concept of strong connectedness. A directed graph is said to be strongly connected. If for any pair of nodes X and Y, there is a directed path in the right direction of all the arrows from X to Y and a directed path from Y to X. Um, another way to say this is between any pair of nodes, you can always follow the arrows and get there without violating the direction of those arrows. Okay. Um, you can already see that uh, somehow the idea of strong connectedness is related to the idea of cycles. Because if there's a path from X to Y and from Y to X, then there's a, then there's a non-trivial cycle that's happening in that, uh, in that graph. Okay. So this, this, this uh, interaction between connectedness and cycles uh, is uh, really central to a lot of the beautiful results in graph theory, and we will rely on it. Um, a directed cycle is the obvious thing. You know, you follow, start at some node, you follow the arrows in the right direction, and eventually you get back to that starting. Um, more important, uh, as sort of atoms of cycles, are, is this idea of a directed simple cycle. Uh, a figure eight, for example, is not a simple cycle because you revisit the same node in the beginning. It can be decomposed into two uh, simple cycles. So basically, the nodes cannot repeat in a simple cycle. And you can make up any other cycle by combining simple cycles in the right. Um, so that's cycles. What about connectedness? And this, I think, is something which um, maybe not too familiar to people, but it's a very simple concept. I give you a graph, and I say it is strongly connected. And now I ask you to try and remove the strong connectedness property. You have to somehow break a path between uh, two nodes. And you try doing this. And it turns out that of all the ways you could do it, um, you need to take out at least K, uh, it's, uh, sorry, if you, if you take out fewer than K edges, right, the thing still remains strongly connected. Okay, and that's an indication of how tightly connected, how many different ways there are of going between these different spaces. So connectedness captures that flavor. Okay, so the definition is a graph is K edge strongly connected. It's an awkward term, but it means if I remove fewer than K edges, it is still, still strongly connected. Okay, uh, it doesn't mean that if I remove K edges, it breaks. A graph could be two strongly connected and three strongly connected, but not four strongly connected. 
Yeah, so, the, so the, you can push up the connectivity until it breaks, and that's called the maximal sort of edge connectivity of the graph. And how do you check graph connectedness? One way to do it is to, is to simply break the graph into um, two disjoint subsets and see which edges cross, okay? And how many edges cross? Um, and if a graph is strongly connected, there must be at least one edge crossing in each direction. And if you do this little game across all the ways of partitioning the graph, you will find the minimal cut and you'll find the graph edge connected. Okay, so these are um, some, it's just vocabulary. Um, here's the meat. Uh, here's where the, the, the graph theory really comes into its own. It's the, it's the, the, the relationship between connectivity and cycles. Um, two results which we rely on, and I'll show you in the next few slides. One is called cycle labeling, and this is a result which is, um, it's something we proved for ourselves. Um, you know, it's not in the textbooks, but it's easy enough to prove. If I give you a strongly connected graph, and I can find its directed simple cycles, okay? Each edge of a strongly connected graph belongs to a distinct set of directed simple cycles. So th there's not any two edges that belong to the same set of cycles if and only if the graph does not have a two cut. In other words, there's no partition where there's just one edge going one way and one edge coming the other. The second theorem is a very famous one. It's almost the foundational theorem of this, this part of graph theory. Okay? Uh, if you have a directed graph, the number of pairwise edge independent directed paths, the number of way to go from X to Y without ever using the same edge. Okay? That's sort of a diffuse and global property or at least a distributed property is equal to the minimum number of edges whose removal disconnects um, any directed path from X to Y. And this you can, for some intuition, you can think of the famous um, min cut max flow theorem in a flow system. Between any two parts of a flow system, the maximum flow you can send is equal to the minimum diameter of the pipe uh, across any cut between those two nodes. Okay, so, so those two results are something we're going to use and I'll show you how. So back to vesicle traffic now. Um, so I'm going to finish in the next uh, maybe um, 10 minutes, and I'd like to leave some room for questions if there are any. So I'm going to go through this, but um, I hope I do finish the technical details, and then we can get into the rest of it if we, we have time. So for me, a vesicle traffic system is um, a directed graph, but uh, you have to be a bit more specific because it's not just a flow graph. It's also a chemically labeled graph. The properties of the nodes and edges depend on what molecules there are on them. So the, this immediately means that you have to consider a vesicle traffic system in two different representations. The left representation is what I've been showing you so far. It's a transport graph. There are nodes in gray, there are edges mediated by vesicles, these black directed arrows, okay? But the compositions that correspond to these um, underlie the, the, the binding and unbinding, the specificity checking and so on, okay? So the transport graph on the left may well be the composition graph shown on the right, where there are two compartments, they're chemically distinct. Each compartment makes a vesicle of some composition. And in this case, both compartments make a vesicle of the same composition. And that vesicle fuses back to the compartments. It's a highly, you know, it's a highly unlikely kind of scenario, but I just want to point out that um, this little composition graph with just one vesicle type and two compartments leads you to all these different fluxes. And you have fluxes from a compartment to itself, from one to the other, back from the other one to itself and so on. Um, and what our approach was is to ensure that the fusion properties of every one of these transport fluxes are obeyed by the underlying vesicle and compartment composition. So write down some biophysical function, it could be based on energetics, kinetics, simple Boolean algebra, whatever you want, to ensure that when I say this vesicle fuses the, that, that compartment, it means whatever molecules are on here and whatever ones are on here is consistent with that fusion process. Okay. So uh, a specific example here. Uh, on top, I have the same kind of doodle. I have a cell, a hypothetical cell with four compartments and uh, these six vesicle edges between them. I enforce steady state. And when you do that, uh, it's simple. You just write down the differential equation um, where you have um, some sort of rate R on every edge, um, some amount of some molecule A, which is carried on every vesicle. Um, and uh, you get the simple linear equation. This matrix I is called the incidence matrix of the graph. You can see that it contains for every edge, a column. And so there are six columns and for every compartment, a row. Um, uh, 
The signs indicate departure and arrival from compartments. And every edge is associated with the flux of a molecule. First of all, the flux of the edge in terms of vesicles per unit time and the amount of molecule that vesicle carries, so the R and the A. And steady state means that the amount of that molecule A on the compartments, which I've labeled by capital letters, don't change over time. Okay, and, I mean, this is just basic you know, undergrad level stuff. So you, you write down this differential equation, you set it to zero and you say this is steady state. And if you had come fresh out of a course on linear algebra, you'd say, okay, this is easy. Uh, that means that uh, this vector here must be in the null space of this matrix and, and we're done. Uh, but you'd be wrong because the rates and uh, quantities have to be positive, at least not negative. And once you enforce that, I mean, it turns out that the whole null space is not the right uh, way to think about the system. The right way to think about it, and uh, again, one of those basic results, easy to prove, is that if you have a graph in steady state, but it's a flow graph, so all rates and uh, quantities are positive, uh, then every flux must travel along a directed simple cycle. It's intuitively obvious, so I won't belabor the point. Um, so really the way you want to write down the space, uh, the solution space of this problem is not as a linear combination um, of uh, vectors in the, in the null space, but as a linear combination, but a non-negative linear combination of the directed simple cycles of this graph, right? In this case, by the way, the, the null space dimension and the cycle dimension are the same, but you know, typically you have um, a, a variation between those, right? You could have more cycles. So uh, but once we solve the problem, then the whole solution space reduces to saying that there are three simple cycles and any uh, vector of rates and compositions must be a non-negative linear combination. So C1, C2, C3 are positive. I've just drawn them here to guide you. C1 is this big outer cycle in the clockwise direction and C2 and C3 are two smaller uh, clockwise cycles. So in steady state, if you have a molecule that travels only on vesicles, then it must obey this constraint. It must travel only on these cycles or in some combination of these cycles with some um, amount. So let's, uh, let's do that, right? So in this case, I have three cycles. So in principle, I could have three different molecules traveling on each cycle. Uh, I also want to make membrane, which is on every vesicle, right? So what I've done here on the left is I've labeled every cycle with one unit of membrane and every directed simple cycle with a different molecule. And that's why the first entry of this little composition vector is membrane. The remaining three entries are molecule, the blue molecule, the green molecule, and the red molecule traveling on cycles C1, C2, and C3. And if you just stare back at this uh, lower figure and stare down here, you see I haven't done, I haven't changed anything. This is just another way to label the cycles of the graph. Okay. Um, and remember, if um, the, the total flux of membrane from one compartment to another can be likened to the total flux of vesicles per unit time, because most vesicles in the cell are the same size. So really the first entry of this tuple shows you the rate of vesicles moving and the remaining three show you the rate of each molecule moving. If you divide the last three by the first one, you get the composition of those vesicles, uh, which is the same graph on the right, except that the right one is now the chemical composition diagram, okay? All this is fine, you can always do this, right? But just look and see if you see something interesting about this graph, right? What it is, is every pair of edges has a distinct composition. Uh, which means that I'm somehow able to address each vesicle independently. They don't have any constraints about where they're going to bind or unbind. Um, and this turns out not to be a generic property of graphs, uh, but it's almost a generic property of a directed graph. All you need, necessary and sufficient to make sure that no two edges have the same chemical composition in this little game, is to make sure that the graph has no two cuts, no way to split the nodes where you have just one thing moving from one side and one coming back. Right? And so that's the first theorem that I mentioned about cycle labeling a few slides ago. Um, so I'll make use of this uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes. Now let's, uh, let's get more specific. Now suppose the, the behavior of a vesicle is not simply a, an arbitrary function of its, of its composition, right? But it has to obey what we know about how snares work, okay? Then things become a little more complicated. Um, so I'm going to cover two scenarios of snare regulation. There are many, many more in particular things like combinatorial labeling and, and, and so on, which I'm not covering here, but our approach does cover all those and, and we, we publish this and then I'll maybe direct you to those references. Um, in this case, I'm just going to assume that there are two ways of regulating snares. Either it's by an inhibitor. So a snare is active unless there's an inhibitor bound to it, or it's with an activator. 
which is the other way around. The snare is active only if the activator is bound to. Okay, so, so I've color coded that here. Um, v is the V snare. VI is the V snare bound to the inhibitor. I is the plain inhibitor. Or in the other world, VA is the snare bound to the activator and A is the activator. Okay. Um, so if you're in the inhibitor kind of scenario on the left, then if a V snare is responsible for fusing an arrow, right, then it must be free, not bound to the inhibitor. And then somehow through a series of steps, which I've shown as this wiggly line, through a bunch of other compartments, the V inhibitor complex must be recycled to the source compartment. Okay, and then remember the inhibitor has to be brought back. And that's what I've shown as the minimal requirement to make the blue arrow work. Um, the, the other uh, sort of complementary scenario is that a snare can be activated. And so V and A travel together. But this is sort of even harder because it means that the V snare and the activator have to take two edge independent paths back from the target to the source compartment. Because if they ever go back into the same vesicle, that vesicle would fuse to the target because the snare would become activated. So you can see immediately where things like Menger's theorem uh, come in. So let's take a look at that uh, again, the same example, uh, that uh, graph with four compartments and six edges and ask whether say this edge has a compatible set of edges that allow recycling of the inhibitor or the activator, right? So it turns out this blue edge does allow the inhibitor complex to come, the V inhibitor complex to come back and the inhibitor to get recycled. Right? Similarly on the right, it does turn out that the bottom edge does sustain, does you know, allow two edge independent paths for the V snare and the activator to be returned. Okay, so, so in some cases, this is possible. But now look at the entire network and it turns out that the inhibitor motif is only possible for these three edges, not for the others. And it turns out the activator motif is only possible for this bottom edge, not for the others. So if this is the only flexibility you're allowing me of either activators or inhibitors, or indeed both, there are still two edges which you cannot uh, have proper fusion because the V snares on those would cause aberrant fusion elsewhere. This is a problem. And it turns out I can fix this problem by adding more edges. The bottom graphs are really the minimal amount you need for these four compartments, allowing either inhibitor or activator uh, between the snares. Okay. So again, it's not something you want to do by hand. So I'm going to summarize um, the final result here. I'm not going to prove it to you, um, but the proofs are based on those two little theorems I mentioned a few slides ago. And so remember what we have is, you know, some bunch of nodes and edges, some differential equation uh, saying how things move along these nodes and edges and implementing steady state. So that's underneath all this. Some chemical equation or specificity equation saying that vesicles that contain these molecules will fuse to compartments containing these molecules in these quantities and will not fuse to these others in these quantities. So that, that entire set of biochemistry, I haven't shown it here, but it's there. It'll be you know, a, a Boolean algebra uh, expression or some sigmoidal function of the concentrations. It's all underneath the hood here. Um, but the beauty of graph theory is it allows you to abstract away from all that and say under any kind of functional form for those specificity equations, these are necessary and sufficient conditions for the vesicle traffic system to work in the, uh, the goat, wolf, and, and cabbage sets. So on the left, I've shown you the assumptions. On the right, I've shown you the necessary and sufficient conditions. Let's walk through it. This is my last slide. And so I'll move to questions. Um, so first we assume the cell is in steady state. Not always true, but a reasonable assumption, at least on certain time scales. Molecules are not created, destroyed, or modified. Again, on the time scales of movement, that's true for snares. Um, some molecules are covalently modified, which would lift some of the constraints that I've um, mentioned here. Um, and of course, all membrane integral mo molecules move on vesicles. That's just a matter of definition. Adding more constraints, um, you could say all vesicles carry the same amount of membrane. Not always true, but very close within just a factor of two or three. Suppose two vesicles with the same membrane integral compositions have to have the same fusion function. The function you've written down depends only on the membrane integral components. Like I showed you in the very earliest slide, all the membrane peripheral stuff goes away and the vesicle is left to its own devices based only on the membrane integral stuff, okay? And that is a very tight constraint. Adding more constraints, well, snare pairing, snares are highly fusogenic, right? And either they have activators or inhibitors. And it turns out adding each of these constraints uh, allows you to find graphs or look for graphs where all the constraints are obeyed, the cell is in steady state, and you have a vesicle traffic system. 
since the, the, the regulatory framework becomes less and less flexible as you go downwards on the left, it turns out the graph becomes more and more constrained as you go down on the right. So I'll summarize all our results here. The basic constraints of steady state means that the graph has to be strongly connected. That's all. Any cut across the graph, like these orange cuts, must have an edge going in each direction. It's the, it's the most simple requirement, and it's fairly obvious because if you had vesicles moving one way, not the other, the membrane would just accumulate on one side. Okay? So it's, that's easy. Uh, the second one is the interesting one. If a vesicle's properties are determined by its membrane integral uh, labeling, okay, then just being strongly connected is not enough because you can't always find, uh, you can't always label all edges independently. This has to do with the fact that all edges have to be on some unique combination of cycles to be labeled independently because the membrane integral stuff moves on cycles. It's not so hard though. So as long as the graph is strongly connected and doesn't have a two cut like the stuff I've shown on top, okay? As long as there are enough edges that across every edge, there's at least you know two in one direction, one in the other, you can always find a solution. Making things even less flexible, you say, well, I'm not going to allow arbitrary concentration dependent combinatorial coding. I'm really going to restrict you to snares that have stoichiometric inhibitors or stoichiometric activities. In that case, necessary and sufficient condition is even less flexible. The graph has to have across any cut, two edges going in each direction. This is called two edge strongly connected. And why? It's because of Menger's theorem. It, it has to do with the fact that you, had, you need to find two edge independent paths that recycle these molecules across the global system. So to summarize what we found, um, the vesicle traffic network is an emergent system. This is known just from the cell biology and biophysics. Um, we sort of philosophically know that local molecular rules determine the global structure of the graph, though, though that connection is not you know, fully nailed down in an experimental system. Uh, and what we've shown is that under various very broad assumptions about how molecules work and how stuff moves around the cell, the more flexible the molecular rules, the less constrained the transport graph. You need more and more edges to make everything uh, work out. So with that, uh, I'll stop, uh, leave maybe eight minutes for questions. Um, so I'm at the Simon Center um, for the study of living machines in Bangalore, um, which is where I met Richard. And uh, uh, we, we have a lot of uh, really cool experimental colleagues as well as theoretical colleagues uh, who work on all aspects of biology. Um, we have open calls for, for faculty um, and um, Simon's fellows uh, who are independent um, four-year um, uh, positions. Um, you can find more about it at these websites or you can email me, uh, email addresses in the bottom. This, uh, this little uh, image here I'm very proud of, it's uh, sort of our Simon's logo. Um, on the right is a turtle and on the left is a logo turtle, logo, you know, the old programming language and, and, and somehow uh, yeah. stuff that happens at, uh, at molecular level leads to stuff that happens at the global level. It's a really nice little uh, picture that uh, an artist made for us. Okay, I'll stop and um, I'll leave this slide up and I'll take questions. Thank you.